Aloha, welcome to Family Affairs, coming to you live from the Think Tech studios. I'm your host, Lisa Kimura, here to discuss the issues and policies affecting families in Hawaii and how we can collectively impact change. With me today are my guests, Carrie Wheeling and Vivian Choi from Healthy Mothers Healthy Babies Coalition of Hawaii. As many people know, I've been the executive director of Healthy Mothers Healthy Babies for the past few years, and I've been very much focused on improving lives for mothers and babies. Now I'm going to be moving on to a new role at Aloha United Way, and I wanted to talk about what the future of HMHB looks like. Vivian, Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So we've worked together for a while. What do you love the most about being part of Healthy Mothers Healthy Babies? I'm going to let you go first, oh. Vivian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure being able to work with Healthy Mothers Healthy Babies because it really takes you throughout that whole journey before, during, and after pregnancy for all families. And even though we're Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, we do the full family because it does affect every mother and child. And I think the reason that I enjoy working with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies so much is I have evolved with this organization. I have been involved with it since 2001. I started as a project coordinator, just like Vivian here. Um, did a little bit as an interim ED, then went on to school, came back, was a board member, and now coming back as a clinical services director. And so I think with me, what I can see is the longevity of the organization, how it's changed, how it has evolved, um, and I, you know, still seeing those pukas, if you will, in the community where there are still gaps and there's still a purpose because we provide a very good niche that. Um, you know, we're not a facility. We go out into the community and we work with families. And the good thing about Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies is that we collaborate so well with our perinatal providers. That's been a key of our success and it will be an ongoing key to our success as we evolve. I think so too. HMHB is so well integrated in the community. I think our partnerships are so strong and what we're able to do to connect people to mm -hmm. services and connect organizations and fill in the gaps is crucial. Mm -hmm. You talked a little, bit, a little bit about the evolution that you've mm -hmm. seen, but what does that look like comparatively, say, 10 years ago to what HMHB is doing now? Well, 10 years ago, we didn't have Pico Pals. 10 years ago, we didn't have Cribs for Kids. Um, probably, uh, you know, what we were working on was focusing more on perinatal, uh, improving the system of care for perinatal support workers. So we would do training and education, but I don't think we had the established services that we have now where we can actually work more one-on-one -on -one with women and children. And I think that's been a critical or a pivotal point with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Definitely. Yeah. So Vivian, I know you answer the Mother's Care line. You take a lot of calls. Mm -hmm. And we used to get, or we still absolutely get, a lot of people looking for postpartum support. Um, tell us a little bit about the services that we've added. At yeah. So most recently, we added um, a maternal mental health counselors to our on like to our on-site services so it's great because since we do get these calls from mothers all over the island even statewide um it's nice that we have a, di a direct referral to our two counselors and that way we can get them the help right away and even if they're on another island um one of our counselors does um Telehealth? Telehealth. So that way you'll still be able to get the help you need, even if you're not able to have transportation or you can't go ahead and fly over to another island, which some mothers do have to in order to get the help they need, including like some hospitals to give birth or whatever. But for mental health, we're able to make that take a step forward with that, with right. telehealth. Right. So. And so kind of getting out in the community and things like that mm -hmm. um, and knowing that these questions that moms have are all about how to find support. Tell me about the start of Pico Pals and what that program looks like. So the start of Pico Pals, it was, I think it was you, you and a group of friends that, wa that had babies at the same time but wanted to Find a way for moms to, to get, get better support, yes. get connected. And, and especially during that first few months of um, together with their infant. So Pico Pals is for um, new parents with infants zero to four months. And those first few months are very important with the bonding of the child, but also a lot of mothers tend to feel isolated. And especially when you 
get to bond with other people with babies of the same age, you start to understand and know that it's normal to feel the way you do and actually get to experience the same things with other people with babies the same age. So I think that was what um, got it started. And we've been starting to try and expand Pico Pals every, every day. Yeah. It's a learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Carrie, you led a Pico Pals group yes, and you've I been did. there since the beginning of mm -hmm. the formation. What was your experience as a leader for a group? I absolutely enjoyed it. What you get out of it is just amazing because you're able to see these women come together and come to realization that, oh my God, I'm not the only one going through this. It gives them comfort to know that they have other women that they can share and collaborate with um, and just watch them grow, their concerns, their issues, and just knowing, like what Vivian said, that they're not alone, that there is support out there in the community. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the hardest things for new moms to find is where are those support Definitely. systems because so they isolating. don't know. Um, and so being able to reach out to them. And I think the coolest part about Pico Pals is even though you're with them for 12 weeks, you see the development of the kids and how the moms collaborate and camaraderie. But it's also after the fact because you're still connected with these mm -hmm. moms. So you're really able to see the kids grow and mature and how everyone just kind of evolves and then submerges back into life after having a baby. Mm -hmm. And it's really a neat thing to be a part of and to know that we are a resource for them even as they continue to age because oftentimes moms have baby number two, baby number three. Right. And so it's just nice to know where the resources are in the community for them to go to. Well, and I think the thing that's most impactful is the post-group surveys, and they talk about how without Pico Pals, they don't know how they would have gotten through their first year. Right. Mm -hmm. The fact that they feel mm -hmm. that they've grown so much in their confidence, and mm -hmm. they were so scared to leave the house before, mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden it's like second nature, and they look forward to going out, and, and they have connection. Mm -hmm. um, from the group leader perspective, what kind of support does mm -hmm. HMHB offer in terms of getting new potential group leaders interested and trained? Well, we offer a continual uh, train the trainer, so to speak. So we have a coordinator who really volunteer, volunteers her time when she comes in and who has helped establish the program, um, Leanne, Leanna Lamb. And um, she'll come in, provide the training, which is a national curriculum that we follow. This is not a curriculum that HMHB just made up out of the blue. This is a curriculum that we follow national standards and have adopted it culturally to meet the needs of Hawaii. And so what we do, we actually pull from the moms who have been part of the program, which is how we really, they become so vested. They see the purpose of it, the importance of it. And so these moms want to be able to give back to the next class. So actually our Pico Pals leaders are often mothers who have participated in a Pico Pals class. So we bring them in, we train them, and then we let them grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Vivian, what does a typical training look like? Typical training, so we go through, first of all, um, just go through experiences like if you went through Pico Pals, if you haven't, then why do you want to be a group leader? Most of the time, people want to give back to the community and just see like how HMHB, they see the pukas in the community, like how they can give back and how they can connect other moms as well. And then they go through different exercises and just explain what a facilitator is. We're not an mm -hmm. educator per mm -hmm. se. It's but not a class. It's not a right. class, but we want to facilitate relationship building with everyone in the group and make sure everyone gets their rightful and respectful time to speak their own thoughts, their experiences, and just train the facilitator to be able to understand everyone has their own experiences and such. And then in the training, we have certain prompts and um, each week we have a certain topic the moms will talk about. So we'll practice going through certain topics and how to lead conversations and such. How many families have gone through Pico Pals now? As of right now, I believe the number, so we started in 2017 and um, we've been gaining, gaining momentum. So we should have, um, uh, the program has served over 130 families so far. And yeah. how is it only moms or is it open to everybody? No, it is open to everyone. It is not an, is not an only mom group. Um, all partners and spouses are available and they're welcome to come at any time. 
And I know one of the really thoughtful considerations when the program was developed was to ensure that working moms who mm -hmm. need to go back to work also have the option too. So tell me a little bit about the thoughtfulness and the consideration in terms of when groups are scheduled, where they're scheduled. Yeah, so it really depends on, so one thing that we're, we are definitely trying to work on is gathering more group leaders and different, um, in different areas, different of time, abil time availability and such. So for working moms, and some group leaders have actually come forth and said, I want to give back to the working mom community. So some group leaders have said, oh, I want to go to lead a weekend afternoon or morning time just to give back and be able to have a group because um, working moms aren't available in the weekdays. For so. sure. I mean, I know I went through that myself. Yes. As mm -hmm. you know, I have three children mm -hmm. and yeah. it's really hard to find things that are open to, mm -hmm. to moms. Right. And those stresses that people face when it comes to caring for family, making yes. sure they make ends meet, figuring out ways that they can engage their children mm -hmm. and be good, mm -hmm. positive parents or helping them learn. There's a lot there. Yeah. And on that note, HMHB is very, very big on advocacy. So tell me a little bit, maybe in a nutshell, we're going to take a break in just a mm -hmm. minute, but real quick, tell me about some of the priorities that HMHB has had legislatively. Uh, legislatively, I know we're looking at uh, family leave, you know, making sure that moms can have that support and families, not just moms, it's, you know, mom and dad can have that support once they have baby um, to take the time off that they need to be with baby, cultivate that family and come back. Um, HMHB has always played an important role in the, our advocacy efforts in improving you know, our system of care for uh, moms and babies. Um, so we have the family leave and... Uh, there was, we established the Maternal Mortality oh, yes. Review Panel. Yeah. And the reason for that... Looking at that, yeah. For um, really looking at deaths that occur after birth and why that happens. Because really, as a nation, our numbers, um, as the United States, our numbers should be very low, but we still continue to experience death after birth. And so we need to have a better understanding of why that happens and how can we prevent it. Uh, what are we doing as a state? What are we doing as a nation? And how can we make those improvements? Right, right, mm -hmm. absolutely. And a lot of it too, looking at the integration between poverty, and right. racism, racism, how those social determinants really affect somebody's life expectancy and their right. health. Yep. Um, talk, to me, talk to me a little bit about reproductive health education and priorities for that. Well, that is a huge hot topic. It always has been and it always will be. Um, and it's just the importance of um, being to, able to have that accessible to women when they need it. So whether that be birth control, whether that be uh, a breastfeeding pump, which we've made huge strides in over the past years, but it's making sure that those services are available to women when they need it for uh, whatever their lifespan gives them, working with teens, working with new moms, working you know, with young women, um, making sure that they have the choices in life that they want and can make when the time is appropriate for them. And having those services available to them is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. One of those initiatives is the One Key Question initiative right. that's for health professionals. Mm -hmm. We're going to get, take a short break right now. We'll get a little bit more into that. Okay. Stay with us. We have a lot more to discuss here on Family Affairs at Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we wanna teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on ThinkTech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo.
Welcome back to Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Lisa Kimura. With me again today, Carrie Wheeling and Vivian Choi from Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition. Welcome back. Thank, thank yeah. you. So we were talking a little bit about Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies and what the contributions have been. Mm -hmm. What would you say HMHB's greatest contributions have been to maternal child health in Hawaii? Wow, our greatest contributions. We have done so many things over the years. I think um, even if we start to span back to uh, when I was involved, one of the things that we worked on was um, improving emergency contraception, access to emergency con contraception before it even went available over the counter. Mm -hmm. We worked with the pharmacist. We worked with the community to see how we can improve access to emergency contraception. Well, many, many years later, here we are on a topic of what's called one key question, right? So one key question is a national initiative that Hawaii is working on, and it's really about educating our providers or anyone who has any contact with uh, reproductive age women, right? So spanning many years and asking them really to begin to think about when do you want to be pregnant? Yeah. Because most people don't, when you're young, you don't think about that things. You don't put life in that kind of perspective. You may think, oh yeah, I want to have kids, but really being able to plan it so that you have a healthy pregnancy. And what does that look like? Because in today's age, we're working with pregnant women who have a lot of health conditions, which makes their pregnancy very, very high risk. So the key concept is one key question is to start talking about that early with women. Plan it out with them. What would that look like? How can we make it as healthy as possible? Because even the idea of planning a pregnancy mm -hmm. is not a universal it's belief not. system. Right. 50% of our pregnancies in Hawaii are unplanned. unplanned. Yes, unintended, yeah. and just like the national average mm -hmm. as well. And it doesn't really vary that much state to state. Sometimes right. a little bit worse, but really half yeah. of pregnancies aren't intended. Yeah. And I think the interesting part is that a lot of times the focus is really on how to avoid pregnancy, but we don't often talk about how to have a healthy pregnancy. Correct. And so I think the critical difference with one key question, mm -hmm. the question being, mm -hmm. would you like to mm -hmm. become pregnant in the next year? Right. So there is a real declaration of intention there, not right. just about, do you ever want to get pregnant? Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you think about, do you, you don't want to get pregnant, do you? Right. Like those aren't very constructive right. questions, nor does it put it in a framework of only the next year of their life. Right. So it breaks it down to a much more manageable time frame. Right. But how does that differ from how clinicians are now typically screening women? Well, I think, and uh, for my own personal perspective, I feel like um, one key question is very proactive. We want to get them early on, educate them, work with them, whereas when you see them, when clinicians see them in the hospital, they're already pregnant. So they already have to deal with it um, at the moment instead of trying to work with preventive measures or planning measures to ensure that they have a healthy pregnancy. Um, and that's what one key question is, uh, you know, really pointed at, trying to get them to where they want to be in life. And if within the next year they don't want to be pregnant, then okay, let's plan for that. What are you doing to prevent pregnancy? And it really opens up a better dialogue instead of um, coming into the provider's office saying, oh, I missed my period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I might be pregnant. And sure enough, you know, and then having to backpedal from there. Right. Well, and I think the mm -hmm. other half of the equation also is making sure that there's access. So Correct. if someone does desire to get pregnant or if they don't, mm -hmm. they need to be able to have health insurance. They need to have access to contraception. Right. We need to have to make sure that insurance plans are covering everybody adequately. Right. So, again, that's a role that HMHB has really filled in terms of that system speed building mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the next frontiers for HMHB's role in that systems building right. advocacy? This is a very exciting question for me. I'm so glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. um, because as I have evolved with HMHB, you see the same issues appearing over and over and over again. So, you know, it seems like in some sense we keep doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. So, Really, what we need to do is do something different so we can improve our outcomes. So with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, I think the next step for them is really building a clinical arm 
so that we can collaborate better with the community. The beauty about HMHB is that we're not a facility. Women do not walk into our office and expect to receive services. We can go into the community and help them where they're at. The other big plus for us is being able to work with providers. Where do they see their gaps? Are they having a hard time reaching women? So that clinical arm is helping with tobacco, smoking cessation counseling for those women who smoke, um, hopefully growing into providing um, centering pregnancy or some form of that, right? So we can work with providers. Um, and then I think doula services. So really working with new parents in Hawaii to help fill those pukas again where you know they they may not know these services exist or for whatever reason they're not able to access them in the facilities um, and so having healthy mothers healthy babies create a new arm um, a clinical arm i think is exciting absolutely and something to look forward to absolutely so kind of on that note of mm -hmm. looking forward in future tell me a little bit about first of all the accomplishments that hmhb has had over the years yes well um, we have had some great accomplishments, and um, they have all been due to the collaborative work of you, Lisa, as the executive <laughs> director and the team here, Vivian the team, and yeah. Caitlin, right? Um, and those big accomplishments have been establishing Cribs for Kids and Pico Pals so that we can reach the women when they need the help. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we've accomplished is your recognition. Um, Lisa was just awarded uh, the Pacific Business News 40 Under 40 for her work at HMHB. Which was really exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was really fun for all of us I think, yeah. to celebrate. Um, so she's really, the team there at HMHB has really built a good foundation for us. And like any nonprofit, the challenge is being able to continue it. but. How do you sustain your activities without being fully reliant on grant funding? So that's why we're looking at trying to see what we can do with a clinical component and bill for services. That sustainability piece for mm -hmm. nonprofits is really the key. And I think mm -hmm. something that people who aren't part of the nonprofit industry just don't understand. Uh, yeah. um, and building that in is such an important part of sustainability for revenue for the future for, for all of the efforts. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the new Baby and Me tobacco-free program that's starting. Yes, that's exciting. So um, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies was just awarded a four-year grant from the Hawaii Community Foundation, which is our stepping stone into trying to build for services so we can generate a little bit more income. So what we will be doing is um, hopefully collaborating with the OBGYNs and other perinatal providers who have any moms who are smoking during their pregnancy. There are other uh, hospitals and clinics who do offer this, but it really is a smoking cessation program that works with moms who smoke and it gets them to stop, begin, um, the process of cutting back and stopping smoking. So we reach out to them a few times during their pregnancy. We actually test them because the tobacco and uh, baby free program offers support so we can test them to see if they're still smoking. We can offer incentives so that when they are tobacco free, we can give them vouchers that is good, um, you know, for shopping, whatever they need for them or baby. Um, and so it's a program to really address smoking cessation during pregnancy and reaching out to the moms. And smoking being one of the highest causes of preterm birth right. and many, many other serious issues. Yes. Um, including, of course, death for both mm -hmm. mom and baby. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me a little bit about the referral channel. It's going to be coming from Cribs for Kids. Yes. Yes. So our referral channels right now, we're going to work with Cribs for Kids, our existing programs, and Pico Pals. Um, then from there, what we'll do is we'll reach out to the perinatal providers. Uh, and it's all about collaboration. This is not about trying to poach any women away from any other programs because it's all about supporting them where they're at. And specifically mothers and who specifically have really specific mothers. needs. mothers, yes. And sometimes the OBGYNs that they are having their care through does not offer smoking cessation services. So it would be a nice collaboration because then that OB can say, hey, I can refer you to a program, you know, if you're interested in quitting. And then we're able to reach out to them, 
meet them, you know, where they're at. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how does HMHB most effectively reach people where they're at? A lot of it is grassroots community efforts. I'll have you speak to your experience. Yeah, so following on that point, um, with the tobacco um, free program that we are doing with the Chris for Kids channel, um, it is a safe sleep education class that we do um, have referral agencies. So we do work with partner agencies for that program. And on the referral form, there are like certain risk factors that we do check off. And one of them is, do you smoke? Have you like, have you been smoking for mom and family members? Mm -hmm. And that way, as of right now, for all our Chris for Kids participants, around 20% have already admitted to have been smoking while pregnant. And that's already the first step, getting to know who is Identify. smoking. Mm -hmm. Identifying who has been smoking, if they're going to be smoking afterwards. And then that would be our first step in following up with them after they take our class. So for Chris or Kids, it's very special because only one of its kind in Hawaii where we do a follow up with um, mom and baby all the way to their first year of life. So that way it's a good channel for us to follow up, keep track of baby's health and also being able to follow up with or have you been, you know, that's the channel of being able to connect with the tobacco free program. Right. right. And also a good chance to follow up with whatever kind of case management mm -hmm. they might need in the first year because moms are struggling with a lot of things a lot of times, mm -hmm. um, including mental health mm -hmm. often. Um, and now we have women referred to HMHB's licensed clinical social workers right. for mm -hmm. support. Um, what does that new mom experience feel like? Can you speak to that a little bit as far as the, the isolation and feelings? Oh, well, um, I think that that's one of the biggest aha moments that we get with Pico Pals is moms come in and they're so thankful that they are not alone um, because they don't know who to talk to, because they don't have anyone to talk to, because dad's off at work, you're home alone mm -hmm. with baby. Um, and so that true sense of isolation and being alone is very true. Um, and that's one of the main things we don't want to do with our moms. We don't want to isolate them. We want them to get out. And so I think um, having this program lifts a weight, so to speak. They have a collaboration. They have other women that they can share their worries with, their, aha, I guess what I learned today. This mm -hmm. is what, you know, my baby did. Yeah. And what's different about Pico Pals is instead of, like, people don't intentionally um, tell people, oh, you should do this with your baby. But most of the time, it's family members who've already had kids. Excellent. They're a little bit older yeah. or, like, your fa or like your friends that have already babies. But they're not going through it the same time as you. They'll, all, they'll, be, they'll say, like, oh, it'll get better. Don't mm -hmm. worry. It's fine. But... You truly don't see it happening at the same time as you. That's They're, right. You're not going through the same experiences. That's right. And it's not intentional, but at the same time, being able to see other moms with their babies, you know. A hundred percent. It's Well, thank thing. you. Thank you so much for sharing all this. Thanks for being here today. I know that working with HMHB has been absolutely a joy and a pleasure. Um, and I want to thank you both for being here mm. and sharing your wisdom, sharing your experience. Um, and helping to contribute to make Hawaii a better place for moms and babies. So with that yeah, said, thank you. Thank you for joining us on Family Affairs. I'm Lisa Kimura. Aloha.